if you erred on the side of people are what really makes the difference. And, and one of the phrases I've used throughout my career, especially as I'm getting to know new team members, is what I'm going to demonstrate to you over time is that I have your best interest at heart. And, and I have found during the years that if I actually act that way and am consistent about it and diligent, uh, the chances that A, people will trust you, second, that that they will feel a level of comfort because because uh, people need to feel comfortable at work to do to do their best to do their best work. Welcome back everyone to the Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization Show, the home of Googleization Nation, where we talk with HR and business thought leaders about the crazy shift going on all around us and explore the disruptive convergence of technology, business, and people. Here are your hosts, Ira Wolf and Jason Coffin. Hey, welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Geek Skeezers and Googleization, a show from the People Forward Network. I'm Ira Wolf, and thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. And I'm Jason Cochran. If you think this is just another podcast, think again. We are the voice of the most important, crucial conversations that are confronting business leaders and people today. And our goal is to bring you ways to reimagine tomorrow and explore the impact and convergence of business, technology, and people. This episode of Geek Skeezers and Googleization is sponsored by our partner Y Institute, your personal and professional GPS for a more meaningful life and purpose filled career. You'll hear more about the Y Institute and Y operating system just a little bit later in the show. So, we're talking about leading in turbulent times today. And just minutes before, literally just minutes before, uh, we were ready to go live. I received an email from a good friend of Googleization Nation, Kate Lister. Uh, Kate's the president of Global Workplace Analytics, and she's the co-author the co-author of a new state of the remote work of remote work report of in combination with Al Laboratories. So this news is right off the press, folks, and it comes on the heel of a LinkedIn post that I saw first thing this morning. The first post that showed up on my feed was that three out of four managers plan to cite office attendance in employee performance reviews. Now, I've got two big problems with that. First, annual performance reviews are one of the dumbest and least effective management practices I've, I've ever experienced. Uh, but more importantly, Kate's study showed how out of touch leadership is with its employees. And that's going to be a major part of our topic today when our guest comes on, Jeff Blade. While three out of four managers apparently want workers back, office workers uh, back, 68% of the workers now say that they want to work fully remote or hybrid. That's up from 65% last year. So it's a complete reversal. Three out of four managers want people back. Almost three out of four workers say, we're not coming back. Those wanting to work fully remote, not just hybrid, uh, is up by 6%. So they're moving in the wrong direction. So I haven't had a chance to dig deeper into the report, uh, but we will be doing that. But this is a real warning shot across the bow to managers who think forcing workers back to the office is a great idea. You can download the report at globalworkplaceanalytics.com. And we'll be sure to put it in the comments uh, if you're watching and the, podco but the podcast notes if you're listening. But now it's time for our perfect labor storm segment. On each episode, we focus on one disruptive, surprising, worrisome trend that we believe you should know. Here's today's perfect labor storm trends. These are our sort of da moments, you know, smack on the head. According to the 2022 Global Culture Report from OC Tanner, one third of employees feel disconnected from their leadership teams. From what you just heard, no wonder. A recent Gallup study found that 77% of employees don't trust their leadership. Another dumb moment from what you just heard. According to McKinsey, 76% of employees describe their leaders as toxic. Spot a trend going on. Uh, it's estimated in some studies that 82% of the time businesses fail to choose the right candidate for leadership positions. I mean, Ira, considering that that yesterday was midterm elections, I don't think we could have planned out the timing 
of today's episode on leadership any better any better than we did with Jeff. Um, and certainly we're not going to be diving into politics today, but we're going to talk about leadership uh, nonetheless. And it seems like everywhere you look, collective confidence in leadership is deteriorating, um, whether it's in business with many of the stats we just shared in government, like with what's going on right now in the midterm elections, schools, hospitals, et cetera. Um, it just has been exacerbated by how many leaders don't know how to effectively lead remote teams in, in many cases. And that's having negative consequences when it comes to performance management and promotion practices as well, like you said uh, in Kate's report. And so while we're going to focus on business leadership specifically today with Jeff Blade, I mean, this is going to be through his experiences leading at companies like Steak and Shake, Vera Bradley, and Matilda Jane, to name a few. I can't help but think that the pearls of wisdom that he's going to share with us are going to be beneficial for leadership in areas outside of business as well. And I can't wait to hear Jeff share his leadership stories shortly, which is why I'm going to cut myself off earlier than usual today. So to tee things up, um, I just want to share this quote on leadership that I came across from world-renowned leadership coach and thought leader, John Maxwell. The pessimist complains about the wind. The optimist expects it to change. The leader adjusts the sails. So, Googleization Nation, let's learn to adjust the sails today with Jeff Blade. And before we bring Jeff on, uh, just a reminder that if you are a member of SHRM and you want SHRM credits, all you need to do is go up to googleizationnation.com, go up to the website, uh, click on podcast. There is a short form you need to fill out just to verify that you listened, ask just a few questions, and in return, we will send you the activity code and you can get uh, anywhere between a half and a full credit, depending on the episode. Uh, also, while you're there, if you're not a member of Googleization Nation, please subscribe. We're running a bit of a contest. You'll get a free uh, copy of, or you'll be entered into a contest to uh, win a free copy of my new book. We're we're offering a new winner every day, uh, create great workplaces in a remote world. Perfect. And so without further ado, this seems like a perfect time to bring on our guest today, Jeff Blade. So Googleization Nation, let's give a warm welcome to Jeff. Hey, Jeff, welcome to the show. Hi, Jason. Thank you. Uh... Absolutely. Well, we're excited to have you on because so many times, um, you know, on our shows, we, we get to talk about a lot of theory. We have thought leaders on. And so you're certainly a thought leader. But the exciting thing about today when we talk about leadership is we're going to hear stories from you of things that you've actually, you know, lived through being a, a top level chief financial officer, chief executive officer of leading teams in these turbulent times. And so before we get into some of those those stories, let's start here. Tell us about you and how you got started on your leadership journey. Yeah, thank you. I um I, I grew up in a, uh, in a in a business household, so uh, I'm actually a third generation retailer. My uh, grandfather was an Italian immigrant and owned a single grocery store in the city of Chicago. And my dad spent his entire uh, 43 year career with uh, AP food stores when when that was still uh, a thing, and they were one of the the world's largest retailers. So I kind of grew up um, in consumer businesses. I loved to tag along with my dad to work or going to stores, and so. I think early on, sort of, sort of had uh, had this sense of of serving serving others and especially serving customers, and I think there's a parallel between that and 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 leading and developing people and and teams. And so, I started my career. I'm uh, I was an accounting major at uh, Butler University here in Indianapolis, where I live, and I started my career in public accounting. And in those days, um, in those days. Uh, before before uh, public accounting really went through a major evolution, uh, there was very much of an up and out uh, up and out culture and philosophy, and uh, they knew that very few folks were going to make it to partner, and so they didn't necessarily um, view uh, investing in you or or uh, or um, uh, you know doing other things as as necessary. And so one of the things that struck me early on in my career was okay, wow. I think businesses are really all about people. Um, why, you know, why don't organizations treat them differently, and why are they not the most important thing? And so that question sort of got planted early. Um, and as I had the opportunity to start uh, in public accounting, about year two, you start supervising engagements and having responsibility for for teams and the development of teams and. 
And, and so in those early learnings, um, you know, what I found was, okay, the, the better I got to know my team members, the better job I did of supporting them, really trying to tap into, um, you know, why are, they, why are they here? What are their strengths? How can I support their best efforts, the better performance I got? And, you know, not surprisingly, right? And so as I um, progressed, um, I had the opportunity um, in, uh, I moved on to Kraft Foods after five years in public accounting. And, uh, and Kraft was a wonderful academy company at the time. And I had the opportunity to have eight roles of increasing responsibility over an 11 year period of time at Kraft during a tremendous change. I joined a month before they were acquired by Philip Morris. So I was there during the period where they were putting uh, Kraft, General Foods and Oscar Mayer together as one company. And so they reorged about every year and a half I typically had new roles where I was required to uh, either build the finance team or, or restructure what we had. And uh, again, I kept coming back to this thought of, okay, I think organizations are nothing more than a collection of people. And if we can get the right people in the right roles, if I can do my job of supporting them and really tapping into uh, the best that they have to offer, the chances of success go up dramatically. So I kind of learned it early on uh, by trial and error, but but always this feeling that um, if you erred on the side of people are what really makes the difference. And, and one of the phrases I've used throughout my career, especially as I'm getting to know new team members is, what I'm gonna demonstrate to you over time is that I have your best interest at heart. And, and I have found during the years that if I actually act that way and am consistent about it and diligent, uh, the chances that a people will trust you second that that they will feel a level of comfort because because uh, people need to feel comfortable at work to do to do their best to do their best work. So let me let me pause there, uh, Jason and Ira, and uh, welcome a follow up question on that. Yeah, and Jeff, that takes me back to we we first met each other here in Indianapolis um, around when COVID started. You know, so roughly around three years ago. And one of the stories that you've shared with me that just resonates in terms of you demonstrating, not just talk about, but demonstrating servant leadership was when, uh, you're not going to name the company, but there was kind of a, a mishap that happened in terms of a certain order that needed to get to a university. And tell us that story uh, of, of, of what you did as a leader to, to make up for that mistake that happened when some, a deadline had to be met and certain supplies had to get to this particular location at a particular time. Because I think it's a perfect story of showing how leaders can walk step in step with their staff to not just say that they care, but actually show that they care. Yeah, and uh, if uh, if you'll indulge me a little bit, I'd love to start with just a, a little bit of um, uh, along the lines of leadership philosophy. So I'm a big believer in, uh, in the work of Robert Greenleaf on servant leadership. And I got introduced to his work during my time at Kraft Foods, a uh, organization development professor at Butler University, uh, I was doing a project with him. We were we were providing a, a live uh, a live business initiative we were working on as uh, as as work for his graduate class, and we had the opportunity to talk about leadership philosophy and and uh, and leading in general. And and as I was describing sort of my emerging views on it, he said, you know, that sounds very that sounds really like the work of Robert Greenleaf on servant leadership. And so he introduced me to it. And uh, I, I uh, began to uh, become a student of, of Greenleaf's work on servant leadership. And, and, and Greenleaf's work is all about uh, the leader who is, who is servant first. They have uh, a desire to serve and only then uh, aspire to, to be leaders. And the idea behind it is that uh, they, really, they really are trying to serve the highest needs of, of, uh, of the individual. And, and I view it as sort of broadly stakeholders. So that, that uh, became the grounding for my leadership philosophy early in, in career. And as we as we navigated through COVID, it it has served uh, it has served me really well. And so the the situation that you were um, that you were referring to was uh, I spent the last eighteen months in a turnaround assignment for uh, for a large division of a of a private equity backed company in the graduation services business, serving uh, K through twelve and and colleges. And one of the businesses uh, was related to um, to caps and gowns, which are obviously a integral part of, of uh, graduation ceremonies. And 
Um, the, the thing that was, uh, was so interesting about COVID, obviously it was tremendous disruption when it first happened in March of 20. Um, and that initial reaction was, how do, we, how do we provide remote work? How do we keep uh, workers on the front lines that still have to come every day safe? Um, how do we navigate through uh, keeping the business financially um, stable? But, but as it played out into 2021 and early 22, you know, what we saw was the second wave of the impacts of COVID. And, and that began to be uh, labor shortages because great resignation was uh, fully underway uh, and people were leaving, people became scarce, uh, a bunch of people left the workforce during, during COVID not to return. Uh, we started to see massive supply chain issues, especially if you were foreign sourcing, I uh, started to see inflationary pressures, et cetera. So I, I think it's the most, I think the environment we're actually operating in today is probably the most complex operating environment that I've seen in a, in a 40 year career. Um, typically there are a few moving parts or macro things you got to worry about. Today there are, there are, there are many uh, and they're all happening at one time. So the situation that you referenced uh, was a result of uh, losing losing legacy workers during COVID um, that you could not get back, uh, that had a lot of the institutional knowledge of how the organization actually worked. Second, uh, a lot of the keeper caps and gowns were sourced in Asia and uh, we could get them made, but we couldn't get them through uh, the, port, the ports in the US on time for graduation. Um, and, and there was a shift. Uh, so first of all, graduations this spring were in full, in full bloom. So schools not only came back full force, they made the decisions in many instances late because the spring of 22 still had a little bit of uncertainty to it. So they made the decisions late. Um, they, um, they also, in many instances, uh, especially for colleges and universities, they, they invited multiple classes uh, back for graduation because they didn't have full ceremonies in uh, in 20 or 21 in all instances. Uh, and so demand was extremely strong. Uh, issues with supply and getting the goods on time and then the labor to actually deal with it. So the, the response that uh, we mobilized was um, we created the mantra of uh, we will not miss a single graduation, period, end of story. And I, uh, I serve as a trustee at Butler University and uh, uh, participate in every graduation ceremony. And so I, I know very personally uh, from sitting on the stage at graduation, what it would be like to have a, uh, a high school or a college or university not have caps and gowns for graduation, it'd be catastrophic. And, and they also can't be late. So if graduation's on Saturday, they cannot show up on Tuesday. Uh, so even though um, you know, you wouldn't miss a delivery deadline by very long. Um, in that business, it is time bound and you have no choice. So we created the mantra of we will not miss a single graduation. We will do whatever it takes. And what that ultimately took was it took chartering planes, uh, I think all told seven or eight planes. Uh, it took putting uh, employees on planes with caps and gowns. It took couriering. Uh, it took a lot of creativity. And, uh, and, and for me personally, what that meant was there was nothing else more important than the stakeholders we were trying to serve, um, uh, high school and college administrators, um, our stakeholders, our folks on the, on the lines day to day, because we were asking them to do uh, tremendous work. Some of, some of the goods we produced in house and we were asking people to work 12 and 15 hour days, we were asking them to work six or seven days a week. And so I felt it important to be on the ground. And so I was at our two facilities in central Illinois for, uh, for uh, six plus weeks during the peak of the season. Um, and, and many days I was there at the end of the day, along with other team members. So it was by no means only me, but, uh, but for production workers, for example, at the end of the shift after a 16 hour day, being there to personally thank them as they left for the day. So just trying to make sure that everyone knew that regardless of your role, your level, um, no one was more important than anyone else. And we were all in it together. Jeff, one is I just want to start out by saying is, is I, we, we just met at the beginning of the show. My, my, back, my background and your background, just, it just resonated. 
Um, I'm a third generation retail, maybe even beyond that. Uh, first generation, I knew my grandparents and or I knew my grandfather and, and an uncle and they owned a retail. They came over from Lithuania and, and Poland. And then my parents, all my aunts and uncles, everyone owned a store, children's store, ladies store, men's store, shoe store. I was the black sheep. <laughs> I went to dental school, <laughs> uh, a different path. Sure. And then realized that, hey, my DNA says you're in marketing, you're in business. Uh, and then pursued this path uh, beginning 30 years ago, kind of a, a roundabout way you know, to get there. L let me put my cynic hat on for this, because uh, I have lots of colleagues, friends. Um, I'm familiar with Greenlee's work. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with John Maxwell. So servant leadership is certainly out there. As, a, as someone whose why, whose purpose is contribute, and I know that's Jason's as well, uh, that just wants to add value. You're always looking for ways. I also wrote a book on business motivators, and one of the motivators is social. And it's always looking out for the benefit of other people. That's ingrained in us. That's the DNA. That's the mindset. But not every leader, not every manager has that hard wiring. And I guess the challenge I've always seen with this is people read the book and they say, oh, well, we're going to create policies. We're going to, we're going to act like a servant leader, but it's, it's not part of their heart and soul of that. What advice can you give to people who, I guess, want, they, they truly, their intentions are right, but they're, they're, I guess how their behaviors or how they deliver it is not there. Yeah. It's a it's a great question. We could we could probably spend a really long time on uh, debating answer. A couple couple of thoughts. One one just to your your comment on servant leadership. You know, I've seen I've seen through the years. You know, it's it's it starts with I think the individual who either either is wired that way as you as you suggested. So I think there are certain folks that they just they just have a a heart and a spirit of service. Uh, for others, I think it's a conscious choice to say, you know what, that may not be who I am. It may not be the way I'm I'm wired, but but I think it's I think it's the best either either for purely commercial reasons for the success of of an individual's career or the organization or both. Um, so so I think that you know first there has to be some level of self awareness that says, okay, maybe I'm not I'm not oriented that way, but but I think. The best way to actually be successful in whatever the endeavor is, is to embrace it. So if I am not personally wired that way or I'm not capable of it, how do I how do I complement and surround myself with with a team or with individuals or with a um, a personal or business coach or a thought partner or mentor to be able to do that? And, and that's, that's hard to do, especially in C-suite roles, because the pressure in C-suite roles, I don't think have ever been greater. And, um, you know, the, when you think of governance models, um, every, every business today is under a level of pressures that they've not seen before. So whether it's a family owned business, uh, whether it is a public company or whether it is private equity, which has obviously been uh, continuing to grow as a predominant uh, governance model, and in, and in private equity, you know, you got a short window. You've got four to five years typical hold to be able to produce value. And typically, you know, you're you're being you're being asked to demonstrate uh, significant and early value creation in the first year to eighteen months. That that's an enormous amount of pressure. So I think that I think that it takes um, an individual that's that's willing to be open. But if you're not wired that way, I th I think you have to surround yourself with others. Uh, whether whether and I, and I like the and so I would say team members, especially your CHRO, uh, who is who I've always viewed as as typically that confidant, uh, or or advisors uh, or board members that can help complement that. Because in in my experience, I've I've not seen I know I know uh, popular culture over now a fairly long period of time. There's been this divide between organizations that are like well. You can't be too nice to people. You can't coddle them. You know, there's the whole uh, there was the whole craze in the tech world that, you know, actually actually telling people being blunt and telling them that they weren't very good and creating adversarial actually got better performance. I've I've personally never seen that be the case. 
Uh, we are at the bottom of the hour. We're going to take a really quick break. We're going to hear from our sponsors. Uh, we're talking with Jeff Blade, fascinating conversation about leading in turbulent times, servant leadership. Uh, and we're going to be back because we have some other questions that we want to throw at you, Jeff, and, and be able to pick your brain. So great. Uh, great conversation going on here. Stay tuned, everybody. For most of us, change is freaking terrifying. And unfortunately, there's no app to adapt. That might change in the not-so-distant future. But for now, we're on our own. That means we can either accept our default future or reimagine our tomorrow. For those of you who choose default, good luck. Just remember, there's no pause button for change. You can't turn back the clock. And there's no get-out-of-jail-free card in this age of perpetual uncertainty. Like it or not, change will happen all around us. And that change is not becoming just more disruptive and frequent, but volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, or VUCA. Fortunately, you can make change work for you and turn it into your personal and competitive advantage. Reimagine your future to one in which you're living with purpose, you're happy, and you're growing, thriving, and flourishing. If you're ready to rewrite your next life chapter and regain control of your destiny, in this never normal world, your journey starts here. Contact the leader in adaptability and making change work for you, your team, and your organization. Ira S. Wolf, adaptability.expert. There's a certain kind of coach who believes what we believe, who leads people to greatness, who gets people unstuck who unlocks all of your passion. A coach who helps people discover what drives them to tap into their superpowers. Then knowing your why is the first step to untap potential, to focus, to breakthroughs. A coach who's looking for a better way. Are you that coach? Hey, welcome back, everybody, to Geek Skeezers and Googleization Nation. Thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. We're here today with Jeff Blade. Uh, we've been talking about leading in turbulent times, how to lead with the servant leader's uh, touch. Uh, Jeff, you, right before the break, you you mentioned about building a team. If you if you don't if you're just not a hardwired, that's just not your passion. Uh, I guess you can try to fake it till you make it, but you can also surround yourself by the right people. And you mentioned the CHRO. But before I we, we dig into that, just want to bring in something else that just came out. Uh, there's the Women in the Workplace uh, report just came out by McKinsey about two weeks ago. And, you know, they talked about the number of women in the workplace. There's an exodus of women leaving the workplace. Uh, because of microaggressions and a whole series of other things. But the, the one thing that I found super interesting, and because this is a sense of doing the right thing, wanting to do the right thing, but the little subtle changes underneath. What they found was, is that, that like uh, DEI initiatives are usually given to women and maybe and that fits with CHROs because a lot of the HR the, the HR uh, industry profession is just was was predominantly women but what happens is is that the DEI is a major organizational change the efforts the time it takes it's not just a task it 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 just drains their time so that's their focus Except when it comes to evaluation, when it comes to promotion, it comes to recognition, it comes to rewards, DEI is not included in their individual performance. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the reason I made that comment before is because it, you know, it goes back to my view that uh, at the end of the day, organizations are just a collection of people. And if you can get the, if you can get the right collection of people uh, and, and you can, you uh, you can be clear about organization purpose and strategy, and you create the right organization structure. You have the right people in the right roles. You have, you have. I, I, I believe you can figure most things out. I've never seen the opposite truth. So I've been in organizations where I've worked for leaders who have said, 
hey, if we have the right strategy, it doesn't really matter, we'll be able to pull it off. You know, even if we don't have the best people or we're not clear on roles, et cetera. I've never seen, I've never seen that actually work. So given, given that sort of bias that I have, to me, the person that has always been the most important partner is the CHRO. And I think, I think today, more so than ever, uh, the CHRO in every organization, regardless of size, uh, not only should, but needs to have an absolute seat at the table, be part of leading the organization. And for some that may make, that may take a shift um, because not all CHROs like other functions, not all are wired to, to necessarily be operators or have an operating bias, but, but they're really needed. So, so I would say one huge opportunity for individuals to grow uh, uh, second needed needed in the C-suite like never before um, to help set strategy to ensure that the organization is competitive and and that's where I think DEI really comes in because the reality is 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 if you're not and I I had the good fortune to grow up in at a time when um, it wasn't it certainly wasn't labeled in in the way it is today but but organizations were being very progressive a long time ago and recognizing that uh you do have to have diversity you have to be you have to provide equity be inclusive etc so they they're they're naturally the leaders of it and i think if they can do it from a strategic perspective in in combination with how do we ensure we have the best people and also playing a role with the ceo and board and other leadership team members in helping to to um, to develop organization purpose so really tapping into why are we really here and what are we really trying to do and have a real differentiator because without that today that's part of the reason you're seeing the great resignation People aren't buying into organizations that are ambivalent about people. Jeff, I've got a couple questions for you. The first one relates to the, the, the HR leader. We have a lot of HR leaders who listen to this show. And one of the common things we often talk about in episodes is, you know, how do we get them to seat at the table, right? How do they get there? But then how do you talk the talk and walk the walk with the data that CEOs and CFOs need to operate the business and be able to make predictions? So the first question is, thinking through that, what were the types of reports or things that you were looking for from your CHROs that they brought into those conversations that helped you as the top level executive make decisions? Let's start with that one. And then I want to ask you a question about purpose and some of the things that you did at Matilda Jane to bring that to life. But let's start with that CHRO question. Yeah, the, the very best CHROs that I've worked with and the ones that I seek out uh, when I'm trying to fill a CHR role are the ones that first and foremost uh, view themselves as the chief people officers of the organization. And some, some in some organizations actually have that title. But, but regardless of title or legitimate power that they're given, the way that they're wired, the way they think is, I am responsible for the talent in this organization. And without the right talent, the organization cannot be successful. So first, I would say, I would say, um, you know, to, to those of you who who think that way and that's the way you're wired, terrific. Live into it, claim it, uh, push push forward hard. For those that maybe haven't felt like they um, they have that right or the organization doesn't recognize it or whatever, um, I I can guarantee you that every organization today absolutely 100% needs it and would encourage you to be forceful and push forward and have uh, maybe some crucial conversations with the CEO you report to or with board members or mentors to figure out exactly how you do it. Because the need is absolutely certainly there. And, and I'm not seeing, I see very few organizations where people are like, wow, we are amazing at the talent and people stuff. You know, We're able to easily recruit we train in incredibly, you know, we're great trainers. We never lose anyone. Like I, I never have those conversations. So the CHR role is more needed than ever. And I would say a couple of things. One being in terms of reports, um, I think it's less about reports. It's more about strategy. I think there's several key places they need to play. One, one is being the thought partner with the CEO and other critical leaders in defining um purpose, strategy, and making sure that the organization structure links to that. Because I see a lot of instances where uh, the organization structure and therefore the talent alignment 
is disconnected from the strategy of what you're actually trying to achieve. And, and when that takes place, there's no way for it to be successful. So I think they're the keepers of that. And then they're the keepers of, okay, we have the organization structure. Do we have the roles properly defined? I can't tell you how many times people interview for, take jobs, and they're like, okay, this is completely different than what I thought I interviewed for, and I'm actually not a good fit for it. And it's like, well, yeah, because no one took the time to really define exactly what was being looked for. And then third, the keeper of how do we successfully onboard and train and nurture our talent? I think that in the short-term orientation that we've gotten ourselves into in the business world, um, I think, I think uh, there's, there's no longer this view that we, that we as leaders have a responsibility to develop and nurture talent. It's, okay, if someone's not getting it done, we'll fire them and we'll go find someone new. And, and that, that is often incredibly short-sighted. So I would say owner of strategy, second, um, the quality and health of the team. Like I wanna see reporting on that. I wanna know how long it takes to fill roles. I wanna know whether we have a development plan for every individual, um, things, things along those lines. So, so less day-to-day, week-to-week numbers, but the, but the qualitative and quantitative uh, uh, demonstration that we're, that we're uh, tending to talent. And you also mentioned infusing purpose in there as well. And so I know you've shared a story with me before about how you did that, um, help bring purpose into the organization at Matilda Jane. So tell us a little bit about that story as well. Yeah, so um, through the years, and like many uh, many listeners and, and Jason and Ira, um, you know, I've been in many instances where you sit in a boardroom and you spend the day or a couple of days defining the company's mission, vision, and core values, and put people put it on posters and put it on the wall, and then and then uh, proceed to not live into it. And and so and, and I've been certainly party party of those in in the past, and and. In, in, in over the last number of years, uh, more recently, what I've gravitated to is the concept of purpose. And so rather than a mission, vision, values, et cetera, what, it, what I've tried to do is create a, a statement of purpose. Why do we really exist? What's our why? And I'm a big fan of uh, the work of uh, uh, an individual named Bob Quinn and Anjan Thakur. Uh, they're professors at the University of Michigan, and they've written extensively on purpose. Uh, They wrote a book a few years ago called The Economics of Higher Purpose. And in there, they make the they make the thesis, which which I fully ascribe to, which is identifying purpose is harder. You actually have to tease it out because it isn't, you know, purpose. Every organization has its purpose. But how do you really tease it out and recognize it? And when you do and when you can when you can crystallize it, you get this one plus one uh, equals three multiplier because people want to be part of something bigger than themselves and they want to come to work knowing that they're doing work that actually matters not just not just making a living or making other people wealthy. Um, so at Matilda Jane specifically, we were a early stage girls children's clothing company, a storytelling brand, a very emotional brand. We sold through independent representatives that we called trunk keepers and we were trying to grow our trunk keeper count because uh, we wanted to penetrate more of the U.S. And we were doing all the rational things that good business people do. We were, we were adjusting the compensation structure. We were providing recruiting incentives. We were doing a number of things and, and it wasn't having much result. And, and so we knew something was missing. So we worked with our creative agency um, and twice a year, we got all our trunk keepers together for the launch of new lines. And at those gatherings over, over three or four gatherings, because we took our time we had, a little, we had a little video booth and we asked trunk keepers just sometime during the two-day gathering, stop by and on, on camera, tell us, tell us why you do this. Why are you part of Matilda Jane Clothing? What do you love about it? Why do you do it? And what we ended up getting was this incredible um, candid footage, emotional response. And, and what came out of it was this idea of Matilda Jane as a gift in their lives. And it was a gift of being able to have alternative employment that enabled them to still contribute to family income, but but uh, but take care of their primary role of raising their children. Um, it was a gift because they got to be uh, leaders and build a team. Uh, they got to provide financial support for their family. So we created this whole campaign 
which was um, giving the gift of Matilda Jane. So with a gift, what you do with gifts, you give them away. And so our appeal was, if Matilda Jane is a gift in your life in whatever way, why would you not share that with others? And, and it ended up absolutely unlocking uh, recruiting because people were like, yeah, I, it's been amazing to me. I, I want to share this. I, I, want, I want others to be able to experience it. That's an incredible story, and it, fit, it certainly aligns with uh, what Jason and I talk about, and, and how I've tried to to live my life. And uh, you know, get, I mean, even going back to even when I had uh, a dental practice, I mean, I owned it, I started it, it was from scratch. Um, I always talked about we, and people would say, "Oh, I didn't know you had partners." And I go, "Well, not in the sense of I'm the only one who has to pay the bills, right. <laughs> but I couldn't have created this if it wasn't for the team." And so the, the I never was really part of who I was. And it, it took a while, but you're right. I mean, to tease out even what my purpose was, my personal purpose or the purpose of the business, it took a long time to tease that out. And that's, you know, Jason and I are, are working with Y Institute and, and, uh, and, and it's, it's so powerful because uh, the, the people that we pass that are struggling. And there's a lot of people struggling. I mean, they, 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 they may know, they, they may feel what their purpose is, but they just can't articulate it. And, and certainly companies can't, or, or they have hire a marketing company to, to create the statement, but it, 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 it looks good, but it, you can't wear it. It doesn't, doesn't feel right on, on your back. Yeah. So Jason, I, um, I think we're probably coming up to um, kind of digging in a little bit more and, into uh, Jeff's personal yeah, <laughs> to learn go. a little bit more about Jeff with our with our lightning round. We want to ask Jeff one question, uh, which we ask all our guests. And it turned out I, I was on a, a call this morning with somebody uh, who was trying to sell me something. And, and, and the question came up and go, hey, I ask everybody else this. I'm going to ask you, what what's one thing that we should have asked you, but we didn't? It's a it's a great question. Um I think I think the one thing is um, how how should leaders how should leaders be feeling about the current environment? Because it, it, it's it's you know it's it's interesting because it's it's very folks are very polarized on how they're thinking about the current operating environment. I got a question for you: <laughs> How should leaders think about <laughs> the future differently? Yeah, well, I I think about it as a um, I think about it, it. Look, it's a super complicated environment to operate in today, no matter what, regardless of your role. But I also think it's uh, I would encourage leaders to think about it in the most optimistic way that they can, because I think that uh, there is more opportunity today because of the disruption that there has never been. So the it, one example would be where you started uh, the the. Uh, podcast this afternoon talking about this whole return to work uh, topic and and how folks are embracing it or not embracing it. And it's very polarizing because there's a number of leaders that are like, no, 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 you've got to come back to the office. And that's just the way it is. Um, we, we had very similar numbers to what you cited uh, in my last employer in terms of folks' uh, desire and intent. I, I think it's a huge opportunity because people were have been super worried about, okay, great resignation, we're losing all our talent, it's gonna be a disaster. It, it's been a huge opportunity because there's also tremendous talent that normally would never be popping their head up that are available. Um, and secondly, um, yeah, it's gonna be complicated, but um, if you can, if you can, uh, if you can, because of a hybrid, have an opportunity to have the best talent, regardless of where they live, uh, I think it's a huge competitive advantage. And, and I think the same in, 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 in a bunch of the other dimensions. So if, if employees really don't trust leaders, if they, if they are disgruntled with work they're doing, et cetera, what an amazing opportunity for organizations to re-examine their why and, and how they really tap into purpose. So I, I think that one of the real benefits that can come from COVID is is really a rethinking of some of the fundamentals of how we do business. That's so good, Jeff. And you have given us a lot um, over these last 45 minutes to really think about. And we can't believe we're already coming up to the end of the show. But before we let you go today, we've got to get through the lightning round, which is where we're going to ask you two to three questions just to get to know you a little bit better on a personal level. And so knowing that you're from Indiana, you're in Indianapolis, I've got to lead with this question. If you were given a ticket, 
to go watch a concert over at Deer Creek Amphitheater, who are you going to see? Yeah, it has to be the hometown hometown state uh, state favorite, John Mellencamp. Oh, I like that. John Cougar Mellencamp. Absolutely. Love it. Okay, uh, question number two would be, if you could choose any type of superpower, <laughs> what would it be? Um, uh, definitely, uh, definitely, uh, kindness and the ability to help others. So I, uh, uh, you know, in the busy world we all live in, we're, we're never doing enough to do that. But if I could, if I could literally every day touch people's lives, uh, I can't think of any, any better way to spend my time. Love that. And here's the last one. Um, so what is the best piece of advice maybe that you've ever been given? Hmm. Wow, there's been many because um, I've had some really good mentors that have that have given me advice. Sometimes I didn't always I didn't always appreciate it, but uh, um, I, I think um, I think the best piece of advice ever given was uh, was uh, uh, whenever whenever you're at a point where you're frustrated, uh, things aren't going your way, uh, you're feeling you know, envious of others or frustrated with a situation, fall back to gratitude. And, and I've had periods in my life that have been challenging where um, I kept a gratitude journal every day. And some days that was the, that was the only positive thing that happened in the day, uh, or so I thought. Uh, so I think, uh, I think the, uh, the ability to, uh, to always be able to uh, try and use a lens of gratitude, which is not always easy. Wise, wise words, Jeff. And before we let you go, what are some ways that folks can stay in touch with you and keep up with what you're doing? Yeah, so certainly uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn and uh, would love either invite or uh, uh, connect and uh, would love to have the opportunity to, to meet you and, uh, and chat with you in the future. Jeff, it's been a pleasure. Uh, as you were talking, there were, there were so many things that a uh, little bit of a doppelganger there. Uh, our, our minds are in sync. Uh, some, even, even some of the, uh, the, the metaphors you used uh, are ones that I use, including one and one equals three. So <laughs> I, I use that one often. So I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for sharing your message. Uh, and I'm sure our conversations will continue. And I know you've reached a lot of people today. Great. Thank well, you. Thank you. Appreciate being a part of it. Thanks for the work you're doing. Thanks, Jeff. So Ira, lots of wonderful stories there from Jeff, who you can tell doesn't just talk about servant leadership. He, he lives it and he's done it in businesses. What were some of the takeaways for you today that stuck with you? Well, there's so many, as you said, I, I think that presented um, by some of the shifts, some of these opportunities, some of the hope uh, that is out there uh, is a real opportunity for HR to, to, to not only, I think they have a seat at the table, and, but to really have a voice and act on it. And I think that's what's missing. I think the goal wasn't to get the seat at the table and the goal wasn't just to be able to have, to, to have a voice there. Um, but it really was to act and to make a difference. And uh, hopefully we'll we'll see a change. Absolutely. That, and that second point was the one for me when he went into the HR piece and basically said, you know, if HR can come to the table, you know, to the CEO and CFO and say, this is how we're going to win on talent. And they own that. That's how your voice is heard. That is the top top of mind thing for every seeing every single senior level executive in a business right now in this crazy world is how you are going to win on talent because that's how you win in the marketplace. Um, and so for those of, uh, of our listeners who are the HR leaders, that should give you um, some excitement and encouragement today of knowing if you're thinking, oh, what are all the things I've got to bring to the table to try and get a voice? Jeff was speaking into and saying, if you own how you're going to win on talent, you have a very clear strategy that you propose. That is what's going to get the attention and the respect um, of the other leaders on your team. And you really got to own that space. And yeah, so yeah. without further ado, um, can't believe we, we've come to the end of another show. Uh, we want to thank Jeff for coming on with us today. And thank you, Googleization Nation, for tuning in today. If you haven't liked and subscribed to the podcast, please do so on your favorite podcast platform. And you can also subscribe to our community at GoogleizationNation.com. So until next time, I'm signing off as Jason Cochran. And I'm Ira Wolf. Special thanks to Y Institute for partnering with us and sponsoring this episode. And thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. And until next week, 
Don't let the shift hit your plans. <laughs>